All right, so today we're going to look at paper six, which is the alternative to the practical for biology, and that's ITCSE, Cambridge International Examination, CIE, and that's October, November 2018, and the code is 0610-61. All right, let's begin. Question one. Grapes are soft fruits that contain sugars. Some students investigated the concentration of reducing sugars in grapes. A. Step 1. The students determined the volume of the grapes by placing 50 centimeters cubed of distilled water into a measuring cylinder. Step 2. Four grapes were placed into the measuring cylinder and the total volume of the distilled water and grapes was measured. Figure 1.1 shows the total volume of distilled water and grapes in the measuring cylinder. Okay. All right. So this is figure 1.1. All right, we have four grapes and we have some water up to this line and it shows the meniscus. So A1, calculate the total volume of the four grapes using the information in step one and figure 1.1. Write your answers in the table. All right, so if we look at this, we have, we need to write in the total volume of distilled water in, and the grapes in the measuring cylinder. And then we need to figure out how much the grapes, what the volume of the grapes is. So if we look at this, you always measure from the bottom of the meniscus, okay? So if we draw a line from the bottom of the meniscus, you can see that that looks to be 72 centimeters cubed. So that's 72 centimeters cubed. Okay, so we write that down here. 72 centimeters cubed. And you don't write centimeters cubed in the table because it's in the heading. You will lose a mark if you do. So now the total volume of grapes, well, you know it started off with 50 centimeters cubed, so you have to subtract that from the 72 centimeters cubed. And that equals 22 centimeters cubed. All right, so we write that in here, 22. Okay, two, calculate the average volume of one grape using your answer to 1A1. So the average volume for one grape equals 22 centimeters cubed, and there's four grapes, so we divide it by four grapes. So that equals 5.5 .5 centimeters cubed. All right, that's it. Okay, so we're, continu we're continuing on with the, with the investigation they're doing. So step three, three test tubes were labeled S1, S2, and S3. Five centimeters cubed of a sugar solution, S, was added to test tube S1. One centimeter, one centimeter cubed of solution S and four centimeters cubed of distilled water were added to test tube S2. The contents of S2 were mixed. Step six, 0 0.2 centimeters cubed of solution S and 4.8 centimeters cubed of distilled water were added to test tube S3. And the contents of S3 were mixed. Step seven, grape juice was extracted from 10 grapes. Step eight, Five centimeters cubed of extracted grape juice was placed into a test tube labeled G. And then five centimeters cubed of Benedict solution was added to each of test tubes S1, S2, S3, and G. Test tubes S1, S2, S3, and G were placed into an 80 degrees Celsius water bath. The time at which a color change first appeared in each test tube was recorded. And steps three to 11 were repeated to obtain a second set of results. Okay, let's see what the questions are. So figure 1.2 shows the student's results in minutes and seconds. Okay, so if we look at this, this is S1. This is 100% of the sugar solution, whatever they put in. This is S2. This is, that's one centimeter cubed divided by five centimeters cubed times 100 to, to get the percentage. That is, that is 20% of the original S1 solution, okay? And S3 is uh, 0 0.2 centimeters cubed divided by five centimeters cubed times 100. And that one is 4% of the original solution. Now you don't have to do this, this is just to, to make it so that you're, you are, you're understanding what's happening. Okay, and G is whatever the concentration of the grapes was. So basically you want to compare this with one of these and see which, which one it's closest to to estimate how much sugar is in it. Okay, so three, prepare a table to record the results shown in figure 1.2.
and your table should include the solutions tested, the time in seconds of the first appearance of a color change in each solution, and that's it. Okay. So when you're drawing a table in biology, you should always make sure you draw in all cells and you use a ruler. Okay, so we first, first of all start with the test tube. Okay, we want the time for trial one in seconds, and we want the time for trial two in seconds. We have S1, S2, S3, and G. Okay, now we have to draw in the cells. Okay, now that the cells are drawn in, now we need, just need to fill in the data. All right, looking at these stopwatches, as it says, they are in minutes and seconds, and we need to put have our results in seconds. So we just need to convert one minute and three seconds to seconds. So that's 63 seconds, that's 77 seconds, that is 121 seconds, and that is 36 seconds. Okay, trial two is 52 seconds, then 106 sec seconds, then 152 seconds, and then 45 seconds. All right. All right, so I've entered in the data. Normally, in a, in a table like this, you would have a, a fourth column saying average, but it doesn't ask you for an average. It just wants this information. So we'll just, we'll just leave it like this. Okay, B1. The concentration of reducing sugar in, S, in solution S1 is 200 grams per decimeter cubed. The concentration of reducing sugar in solution S3 is 8 grams per decimeter cubed. Calculate the concentration of reducing sugar in solution S2 using the information in step 5. Okay, step 5 is, it says that 1 centimeter cubed of solution S and 4 centimeters cubed of distilled water were added to S2, and they were mixed. All right. All right, so we are, if we're going to find, first of all, let's find the percent. So the percent of sugar in S2. Okay, we're going to find the percent of the original sugar that was in S2 because we know S1 had 200 grams per centimeter per decimeter cubed, and it, we, if we find the percentage that S2 has of S1, then we can just calculate it like that. So percent of sugar in S2 equals 1.0 centimeters cubed divided by a total of 5.0 centimeters cubed. The rest of it was distilled water. Okay, times 100 to get it into percent, and that is 20%. All right, so S2 has 20% of the sugar as S1. And so we have our concentration of S2. That equals, it starts off as 200 grams per decimeter cubed, and we multiply it by 20%, or by 0.2, equals 40 grams per decimeter cubed. Okay. All right. So the answer there is 40. Okay. We can double check this if you like. You don't have to do this, but you can double check it. So S3 had 0 0.2 centimeters cubed of solution S and the rest was distilled water. Okay. So if we want to say percent of sugar in S3, that equals 0 0.2 two centimeters cubed divided by the 5.0 centimeters cubed times 100 and that equals four percent so the concentration of s3 equals 200 grams per decimeter cubed times four percent and that equals eight grams decimeter cubed. All right. So it checks out. That is a good method to use. You obviously don't have to do this. This is not what they're asking. But if you just want to double check your work, because that's what they're, because they're giving you that information, then why not? Two, state a conclusion for the reducing sugar investigation. Well, looking at the results, you can see that the time it took for um, the first change of color for grapes was significantly less in both trials than it was for any other situation. Okay, that means that there was more reducing sugar 
in the grapes than there was in any of these S1, S2, S3 solutions. So we can say that the grapes have more reducing sugars in than any of the other solutions as it took less time for it to start changing color. Okay, so grapes contain more reducing sugars than S1, S2, and S3 as less time was taken to change color. C1, state one variable that was kept constant in the reducing sugar investigation. And there are lots of things you could put down for this. You could say the volume of the solutions was kept constant. So they kept it five centimeters cubed per solution. Okay, you could also say the volume of the Benedict solution was kept constant, or the concentration of the Benedict solution was kept constant, the type of grape, the temperature of the water bath. Okay, any of those things would be perfectly okay to put down. They were all kept constant, but you only put down one, as it says one, and there's one mark, you don't do more. You would do what exact, exactly what they asked for. Two, the method used to estimate the concentration of reducing sugar in grapes contains potential sources of error. Well, there's always a potential source of error. Practically no investigation is absolutely perfect. State one source of error and suggest an improvement to minimize the error. Okay, so one of the difficult things to do when you're judging color is color is, a, is it can be quite difficult to, to judge. For this, you're trying to state the exact time that the color just starts to change. And that's a difficult thing to, to, to do. So it's difficult to judge the color starting to change. How could you improve it? Well, there's a few ways you could do it. You could use a color chart. So a, a list of colors next to it, you can hold it next to it and say, oh yeah, that has changed a bit. Or you could use a dark or a white background. You can even use a colorimeter. And if you don't know what a colorimeter is, basically you put a little bit of the sample into a little, little tiny container called a cuvette and the, this electronic device shines a light through it. A light goes through and whatever is detected, whatever goes through the other side is detected. Okay, and different colors will have different amounts detected on the other side. Okay, so you could do that. Um, I'll say use a color chart, but any of those would be good. So use a color chart to compare colors is a good idea. Okay, other things you could have said, you could have said, uh, it, the color of the grape juice can get in the way. So if you used red grapes, it can be very difficult to, to judge when it's starting to turn red. Okay, so you use white grapes, it would be the improvement. Um, another thing that they did was they only used three concentration to compare, concentrations to compare with. And none of them were within the range of the grapes. So they want to, you should probably use a larger range of concentrations. They also observed all four tubes at the same time and we're trying to check the times exactly when they started changing color. That can be quite confusing, okay? So uh, an improvement would be to measure each sample separately. Do the test eight separate times. It would take a long time, but you'd probably be more accurate. And also they only did two trials. Generally, you, you do three or more trials. All right, so those are other things you could do. Things you ca cannot do, things you will not get marks for, is if you say human error. Human error does not count as a potential source of error. Humans make errors, but you can't control for it. You can't improve it. If you happen to read it wrong, that's not the equipment's fault. That's not the procedure's fault. That's just, you made a mistake. You need more practice. Okay, so you do not put down human error. You do not say, say you didn't measure the volumes accurately or something like that. Okay, any, any of those other ones would be good though. Three, identify one safety precaution that should be used when carrying out this investigation and give a reason for this precaution. Okay, so whenever you're using any sort of liquid that could, it's not water really, or sugar or salt, that, that could splash, you probably want to put down, you should wear goggles or eye protection. You could even say to wear gloves, okay? So you can wear eye protection or gloves. And the reason for this is because Benedict's solution is an irritant. Okay, another thing you'd want to talk about is the fact you're using hot water, either with a Bunsen burner or with a water bath. And the way you uh, protect yourself against this hot water is you don't take the test tubes out by hand, you use tongs. So you could say you use tongs because you're dealing with hot water from water bath. Okay, but only put one of those answer down use tongs, don't just say tongs. Use tongs, okay, or use tongs to remove the test tubes. 
All right, but only one safety precaution is asked for. D. Grapes develop in, in large groups attached to their parent plant. As they develop, grapes increase in size and ripen. Figure 1.3 shows one group of grapes. A student suggested that the concentration of reducing sugars in grapes changed as the grapes developed and ripened. Describe how the method used in steps 3 to 12 can be modified to determine if there is a change in the concentration of reducing sugars in grapes during development. Okay, so to do this, you have to, it's only two marks, so you don't want to go on and on and on. So what you want to do is it says that as the grapes get older, they get bigger. So you want to take groups, uh, you want to take the grapes from of different sizes and you want to make sure they're from the same bunch on the same plant. Okay, so here you're saying what you're changing, the different sizes, and you're keeping it the same, that they're the same bunches on the same plant because different size grapes might, they might be different from on different bunches. So once you have the grapes, you test those grapes for the amount of sugar they have with Benedict's. So you can test with Benedict's solution to find the time a color change first appears as before. All right, good. But you want to specify your testing with Benedict's. Don't just say, do everything that you did before. Complete the experiment as before. You want to say you test with Benedict's solution. They like you to be specific. E. Some students placed eight grapes that had been picked at different ages into water. They measured the change in volume of the grapes after 24 hours. Table 1.2 shows the results of this investigation. Aha! Uh -huh. So here's a table and here's one blank space. Hmm. 1. Calculate the percentage change in volume of grapes aged 84 days. Write your answer in Table 1.2 and show your working. All right. So the change in volume. First of all, we have to figure out the change in volume. equals the final minus the initial. So that's 36.6 centimeters cubed minus 30.0 centimeters cubed, which equals 6.6 .6 centimeters cubed. So that's 36.6, that's the final minus the initial, and that equals 6.6 .6 centimeters cubed. Now we need to find the percent change in volume, and that equals 6.6 .6 centimeters cubed, so the change in volume, divided by the total starting volume, 30.0 centimeters cubed times 100. And the answer there is 22%. So we have to write 22 up the top here. All right, good. So you figure out the change in volume, then the percent change in volume. And that's it. And here's the graphing question for this exam. Two, plot a line graph on the grid of the age of the grapes against the percentage change in volume. All right, so first of all, we have to do the axes. Okay, so it says to plot the age of the grapes against the percentage change in volume. Okay, so age of the grapes, that is what you're changing. So age of grapes and the units are in days according to the table, and we want to do the change in volume, and the units are in percent. Okay, so if we look at our table again, okay, we have 12 squares to go 120 days, so obviously that is 10, 10 days per square, large square. Okay, so that's zero, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, one, that's 100, not 110, and 120. All right, and on the y-axis, so we have eight cells to get up uh, to about 35%. Okay, so that would be nicely done by going up by fives. So 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 40, 35, 40. All right, so now let's just plot the points. Okay, so these are the, this is the data plotted on the graph. Now we need to decide what type of line to draw. Do we draw a straight line with a ruler or do we draw it as a curve. For this, it's a bit ambiguous because if you look at it, 
it looks pretty straight, but around here it seems to do something funny. It seems to start going up a little bit higher. Okay, so it's not actually a straight line. So this is pretty straight down here and this is pretty straight up here, but in the middle it's not. So let's just draw a line. Okay, so I've drawn a line and I did something here which I don't normally do. I combined using a ruler and not because the last bit, those three are very, very straight in line. And the first bit, all oh, those are straight in line, but in the middle they're not. So I joined those, I'd used a ruler for the first and the last and I joined those freehand. But you can't just draw a straight line all the way through because that's not the trend. Okay. If you wanted to do it all freehand, that would also be okay. Okay, both would be good. Three, describe the trend shown by the results in table 1.2 and your graph. Okay, so it's describe. So what you can see is that all the way through, as the age of the grape increased, the percent change of volume also increased. However, for the first about, ooh, 84 days, the percent change in volume was was slower than for the last 84 days. So you can say that there's a steeper increase for the last bit. Okay, so you can say as the age of the grapes increased, the percentage change in volume increased, and the steeper and there was a steeper increase from 84 days onwards. You could also say that from between the ages of 12 and 84 days, the percent change was uh, two percent for every 12 days, and between ages 96 to 120 days, the percent change was 5% for every 12 days. It's the same thing, but the second is being a bit more specific. But when it does say, describe the trends in the graph, you probably want to quote something from the graph. Here we're, we're saying from 84 days onwards. You generally always want to have some particular number from the graph. Okay, don't just say uh, it increased a after a time or something like that. You want to be specific. Four, state the variable that was changed, the independent variable in this investigation, and that was the age of the grapes. Okay, that's the age of the grapes, that was because you only changed one thing. Okay, that is the end of this first question. That's a whole 25 marks. Okay, let's go on to the next. Two, figure 2.1 shows a photomicrograph of part of the lung of a mammal. Okay, so let's look at this. So in the lungs, we have the alveoli. So this, each one of these big air sacs, these are big things here, that's one air sac, one alveolus. This is another alveolus, okay? And in among the alveoli are capillaries. So this is one capillary labeled with some lines across it for measuring. This is another capillary and another one. They're the circles in between bigger circles. And you can see inside some of the capillaries, you can see some, some stuff. Those are the red blood cells. And inside other ones, you can't, just depending on where, on how it was cut. Okay. All right. So let's look at the question. A1. Measure the diameter of the capillary labeled A using the two lines drawn on the capillary in figure 2.1. Include the unit. So we have to measure diameter 1, diameter 2, and then we have to calculate the average diameter of capillary A. Okay, that is this right here. And when I put my ruler across, the vertical, the vertical line, I measured it as 6 millimeters. And the horizontal line, that was 9 millimeters. Okay, I got these numbers. And th th those are the answers in the back of the book. However, if you printed it off on a different scale, you might get a slightly different number. Don't panic as long as you know how to use it and how to do the calculations. Okay, but if you did get a different measurement, first of all, make sure you know how to use a ruler. And if you do, use the numbers that are provided in the, in the mark scheme because there's more calculations after this. All right, um, another thing you'll note is measure in millimeters. You're much more likely to be more accurate in millimeters rather than centimeters. It's it's just one more conversion you have to make. All right, so let's write that down. So we have six millimeters in the first one and nine millimeters as diameter two. Okay, so the average 
equals six millimeters plus nine millimeters divided by two, which equals 7.5 millimeters. That's 7.5 millimeters. And if you notice, there's no units on here, so you have to include the units. All right, next. Two, calculate the actual average diameter of capillary A using your answer to 2A1 and the formula. Okay, so the magnification is the average diameter of capillary A on figure 2.1 and the actual average diameter of capillary A. And I've even given you the conversion to micrometers because you need to give your answer to the nearest whole micrometer. Make sure you read these last little bits. These are the sorts of things that people often miss. Okay, so we are trying to find the actual diameter of capillary A. So the actual equals the diameter in figure 2.1 divided by the magnification. Okay, we calculated the figure 2.1 to be 7.5 millimeters. Okay, and the magnification was 1200 times. And that is right here. It says so right here. Okay, so magnification is 1200 times. So if you do that in calculation, that equals 0 0.0062 five millimeters, but they want their answer in micrometers. So you have to multiply that by 1000 micrometers per millimeter. If ever, you never, if ever you forget, if you multiply or divide, first of all, think logically, do you want a bigger number or a smaller number? If you have one millimeter, do you want lots of micrometers or do you want very few micrometers? And one micrometer, one millimeter, you need lots will contain lots of micrometers so you need to multiply another thing you, you can do is write in the units so it's 1000 micrometers in every millimeter so then you can just cross out that and go oh yeah it adds up as micrometers this is the right way so that equals 6.25 micrometers but remember you need to read this final thing give your answer to the nearest whole micrometer that is six micrometers all right don't lose a silly mark for not reading the final little bit. And three, make a large drawing of three alveoli and one capillary that are next to each other in figure 2.1. Do not draw individual cells. Okay, this is the part of the biology exam that I always dread because I'm not an artist. You do not have to be an artist though to draw in biology, okay? What you have to do is just draw what you see and draw in pencil so you can do lots of erasing and draw with a sharp pencil so you can be very clear on your lines and don't draw really hard if you draw really hard then you can then when you erase it you can see what you've, you've left behind okay so those are important other things you must do in biology you must make sure you take up as much of the space as you can without going over the the writing without going out of the space you need to if it says labeled you need to make sure you label it um, and you need to make sure you draw very clear lines connecting okay so th that's a good circle this is not a circle you will lose marks if you draw a circle like that you have to draw them so that all the lines connect if they're supposed to um, never do shading so you never try to shade in a darker area okay you will lose marks for that and you never do feathering you never go okay so it's kind of like this it looks sort of like that that's feathering you will lose marks for feathering okay so going back to the diagram it says three alveoli and one capillary okay so if we look at this we could draw any of the alveoli okay we could draw one draw one this is pretty much how you draw it one let's do it like this two three and then one capillary okay you probably want to label that and make sure those touch and this is obviously you don't draw it on here you draw it on in the section they give you and when you draw it you always make sure if you look at this this is not one single line. This is actually, it has a thickness. So you have to draw two lines 
to show that there is a thickness. Okay, that's very important. All right, so let's let's go and start working on that drawing. Okay, this is my attempt at drawing three alveoli and one capillary. Now, if you notice, it is pretty close to those three that I drew, I demonstrated. Um, it's not perfect. Keep in mind, this is an exam. You only have a certain amount of time. Um, but you have to be very careful to try and get all your lines smoothly connected. Now, if you notice, and so this is kind of wobbly because I'm of the, the surface I'm writing on. Um, if you notice, the alveoli and the capillary, they have a thickness. So I drew in two lines, which makes it a little bit more complicated, but it's, it's important. All right. Now the things you'll get marks for, for this, okay, that one of the marks is that there's a con clear and continuous line with no shading. Okay, you didn't draw in any, you didn't do any shading at all. You didn't draw in any cells because it asks you not to draw in cells. It says do not draw individual cells. Um, another mark is for, did you actually draw three capillaries, uh, three alveoli and one capillary? Um, as best as that you can, they should be identifiable which ones you did from the, from the, from the diagram. Okay. Uh, they they won't go through every single spot and go oh that's out just a little bit from what it looks like they won't they won't do that they are marking hundreds of these exams so so don't worry about that but they do want to make sure you've done it carefully another mark is that you've actually drawn the thickness to to the cells okay and another mark is did you take up up enough space it needs to be at least half of the space you're given okay read this question again carefully it says it does not say anywhere on here to make sure you label the capillary or the or an alveolus because quite often it does and people miss that okay it doesn't state that so it's okay you don't have to worry about that all right so that is a drawing question b some students measured the average increase in chest circumference during breathing when at rest each student wrapped a tape measure around their body just below the armpits as shown in figure 2.2 all right, so they're up to tape measure around their body. Each student then breathed out and took a measurement of their chest circumference. Then they breathed in and took a second measurement. The difference between the two measurements is the increase in chest circumference. Table 2.1 shows the, the results of their measurements. Okay, this is table 2.1. All right, and if you see down here, one, calculate the average increase in chest circumference for females and write your answer in table 2.1. All right, so we do, we type into our calculator, 32 plus 37 plus 20, 25 plus 38 plus 27 plus 30 plus 22 plus 38 plus 27 plus 34 and divide it by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 results. And the answer we get, so 10, and that equals 31. It doesn't actually say to show your work, so you don't have to you don't have to write that down. You just type it into your calculator. Okay, 31. All right, good, nice and easy. And two, describe how the students could find out the effects of exercise intensity on chest circumference during breathing. All right. So this is describing an experiment, and in every experiment, you have to have an independent variable, a dependent variable some controlled variables and a method, okay? You need to make sure you have some points from each one of those sections. You have five marks, so you have to make sure you include each one of these. Okay, so the independent variable, you don't need to state that it's the independent variable, but the independent variable is you, or you can state it, you change the intensity of the exercise. Okay, you might want to say the speed of running or something like that. Okay, the dependent variable what are you measuring? You measure the chest circumference. Okay, there'll be two marks there. The controlled variables. Okay, there's lots and lots of things you put down, 
but you probably only want to put down two or three. Okay, so you want to maybe say the same number of students from each sex or the same fitness level or at the same time after eating or drinking or make sure that nobody's on medication or haven't had, hasn't had caffeine or something. Um, you make sure, we want to make sure they're in the same environment, maybe same temperature, same altitude. You want to make sure they exercise for the same amount of time and the same type of exercise. So only put down a couple of those because that's a lot more than five marks there. Okay, so the same number of students from each sex, same time after eating or drinking. And just, as I said, there's lots of other things you can put down, but only put down a couple. Okay, and your method. Okay. So first of all, you want to measure the increase in chest circumference as soon as the exercise is complete. And so measure the increase in chest circumference as soon as the exercise is complete. And the reason for that is because if you give them time to, to recover, then it will go back to normal and you're not doing a very good uh, experiment. You want to make sure they rest before carrying out a higher intensity exercise. You might, you might want to make sure there's two or more repeats for each person or and maybe three or more people doing the test. Okay, so rest before carrying out higher intensity exercise, two or more repeats for each person. Remember, if it's two repeats, that means they've done it once and then they've repeated it twice, so it's three times in total. And you might also want to say something about safety. Okay, you might want to make sure that everybody is healthy. You might want to say about suitable footwear. Okay, so suitable footwear worn by everyone. Okay, so if you notice that there's a lot more than five marks here, you don't have to put everything down. You don't have to write it like how I did with it, with uh, specifying which is the independent or dependent variables. It just might make it easier for the um, for the examiners to find what they're looking for. What you do want to do is bullet points. You want to make sure it's nice and clear, not a big long paragraph that the examiner has to wade through to figure out what you're trying to say. All right, so that is the end of that question, and it's also the end of this exam. I hope you found this helpful. If you did, please press the like button and subscribe as well. We really appreciate it. If you have any other questions or comments, please ask them in the discussion section below and have a great day.